All right. Well, um, this morning we're going to continue through um, our series on the church. And my notes are not wanting to pull up, and so we're in big trouble, y'all. That's my worst nightmare, and I didn't print a backup. So we're going to, it'll be okay. Here we go. We're going to uh, talk about our series on the church today. Uh, we're going to be wrapping it up. So um, I hope this has helpful. I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope it has been thought provoking to think about the church. Um, the church clearly is important. We are the the Bible says the church is the pillar and the buttress of the truth. We are the we are the the the, the temple of God by the Spirit. Um, Christ is the head of the church. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, we are those who have been ransomed by the blood of Christ. And so church is not a small deal. It's a big deal. And the Bible has a lot to say about what the church is and how it's to function. We've talked about the purpose of the church, why it exists. We've talked about the mission of the church, which has been the both the internal uh, mission uh, uh, and the external mission of the church. There's an internal component and an external component of the church, of the mission of the church. Uh, we've talked about a discipline of the church. We've talked about worship of the church. We've talked about membership of the church. And so the final thing we're going to talk about this morning is governance. Who leads the church? Governance. Who leads the church? Before we get started, let me pray for us uh, one more time. King Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. Um, it truly is a privilege. God, and I just pray that you would speak to us this morning. As your word says, um, you are the good shepherd and your sheep hear your voice. And so I pray that we would hear you speaking to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be talking about um, who leads the church. Uh, from John chapter, we're going to begin in John chapter 10. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to John chapter 10. Um, so John chapter 10 is a famous passage about uh, Jesus being the good shepherd. Jesus being the good shepherd. As you know, um, many, most of Jesus' conflict in the New Testament uh, was his conflict with the scribes and the Pharisees, right? And it was a, it was a conflict over leadership, over leadership. Who leads the church? And what I want to tell you this morning is that Jesus leads the church. Jesus leads the church. So we're going to talk about this morning from John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. If you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. I'm going to read John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. The word of God. You may be seated. So we're, we're wrapping up this series on the church. We've tried, to, we've tried to think biblically and theologically about some of the proposed changes that, that are being proposed. And today we're going to talk about governance, who leads the church. So um, one of the godliest man, men that I've ever known, uh, Brother Al Jackson, um, a mentor at Lakeview Baptist Church, where he pastored for around 40 years. And, um, and when you pastor somewhere for 40 years, uh, people begin to say things like, yeah, Lakeview, that's, that's Al's church. That's Al's church. And every time somebody would say that, Al would get mad. Because Al would say, this ain't my church. This is Jesus' church. 
This is Jesus' church. It's not my church, it's Jesus' church. And all the talk about constitutions and bylaws and committees and so forth, the crucial thing we can never forget about the church is that Jesus leads the church. Jesus is the leader of the church. Christ is king. Before the church is mine, before it is yours, it's Jesus's. And it's his will, not anyone else's, that must reign supreme within the life of the church. In this passage in the Gospel of John, Jesus is just off of this controversy with the scribes and the Pharisees. You can, you can look there, probably in the headings in your Bible. And Jesus has healed a man born blind on the Sabbath. Ooh. But, of course, Sabbath breaking was not a small deal. But they totally misunderstood the purpose of the Sabbath. And that was one of the great issues that Jesus faced with the religious leaders is the fact that he was doing good to people on the Sabbath. And then, and so that, and so it's, it's that context that leads into verse, in, into chapter 10 where he talks about the good shepherd. So that's important, uh, for, for our context here because the conflict between the scribes and the Pharisees and Jesus that, that really is present in all four gospels and that, that's kind of the, a, a a major theme in all four Gospels is it's a conflict concerning who is the true and God-appointed authority for God's people. It was a question of leadership. It was a conflict of leadership. The scribes and the Pharisees believed that they were the ones who properly governed Israel. And Jesus, and by the way, in some ways Jesus acknowledged that, right? Jesus, Jesus said, he said this strange thing. He's like, he said that the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So he kind of acknowledged their authority. And he said, do as they tell you, but don't do as they do. For they tie up burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but aren't willing to lift up a finger to help anybody with them. So Jesus, so the conflict was one of leadership and Jesus Challenge their authority. Now, Jesus wasn't a rebel just to be a rebel. Okay, if you read some of these uh, secular, non-Christian historians and they're reading the New Testament from a completely secular perspective, they'll come and say things like, Jesus was, he was a, he was a political revolutionary. You know, he was just trying to, 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 to upend the, uh, the social order there. But if you read the Gospels with any sense of, um, giving the gospel writers a benefit of the doubt, what, what is clear there is Jesus is not, is not intending to be political. Everything Jesus does is spiritual. It's spiritual. The problem with the authority of the... He would have had no problem with the authority of the scribes and the Pharisees if, in fact, they had been exercising that authority properly. But they weren't, right? Because what were they doing? They had fallen in love with their traditions and the praise of the people more than they had with God. And so, and so he didn't have a problem with them exercising authority if they had, were exercising it correctly, but they weren't. And so Jesus, as Jesus puts it not so subtly here, they were, in Jesus' words, thieves and robbers. Thieves and robbers, that's strong language. Those in authority, uh, like a shepherd, are supposed to care for those in their stead, not to fleece them. Authority isn't bad, so, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, there's this kind of just anti-authoritarianism in our culture today, as if all authority is bad. All authority isn't bad. In fact, there is good and proper authority. In fact, the fundamental Christian confession is Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus himself said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So authority isn't bad, but it must be properly exercised. It's a stewardship. Moses was perhaps the greatest leader uh, in the Old Testament, in Israel's history. But Moses didn't do whatever he wanted. He was supposed to lead God's people God's way. And you know what happened when he blew it. He didn't get to go into the promised land. 
So God does put men in charge of his people, but God is still in charge of the men in charge. And that's how it must be. Or it's how it's supposed to be. Okay, but the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were using the sheep to pat their back, backs and pad their pockets rather than leading them in the fear of God. They didn't, as Jesus said, enter through the door. Okay, and if you, if you go back and, and read his analogy there, it's, <laughs> it's, kind, it's kind of hard to follow because he, he, he kind of, he starts mixing the analogy up a little bit and it's, I mean, the main point is basically clear, but it gets a little bit muddy. But the, Jesus says they didn't enter through the door. And then Jesus later identifies himself as the door. So what that means, what that must mean then is that Jesus is the God ordained means, the God ordained proper means of entry into God's flock. You want to be part of God's flock, you got to go through Jesus in general, in general, and not just that, but into the role of leader in particular, right? The, 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 I think he's, he's likely talking about the scribes and the Pharisees here. They didn't enter through the door. If you want to properly lead God's people, you have to lead through Jesus Christ. As those leaders who Jesus consistently condemned the scribes and the Pharisees. Why? Because they did not recognize who he was. You are wrong, he said, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. If you believe Moses, Jesus said, you would believe me. So, The people who were supposed to be the experts in the scripture, they of all people should have recognized who Jesus was when he came and they didn't. So in so in in not recognizing that they showed that they were not worthy to be leaders of the people because to lead God's people is to lead through Jesus Christ because Jesus is God's appointed king, the shepherd of Israel. And so they, they missed it. The only way to lead God's people is to lead through Jesus Christ. So when Jesus appoints leaders in the early church, right, the 12 apostles, right, they are to do what? They're to proclaim the good news of the kingdom in Jesus Christ because that is the true, he's the true king. And to lead in any way is to lead through Jesus for Jesus. Okay? The the main point I want to highlight here from this passage is, is they're talking about how Jesus is the consummate shepherd, Jesus is the consummate shepherd. In verses 17 and 18 there, Jesus says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So the church belongs to Jesus, and there are many reasons why the church belongs to Jesus, but here is one of the greatest reasons, and that is that Jesus died for us. He's the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Nobody took Jesus's life from him, but he laid it down. From a strict historical perspective, you would think, oh, well, no, look at what happened. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees manipulated things. Pilate washed his hands. The crowd chose Barabbas. And yet, despite all that, the Bible says Jesus didn't have to die. Just hours before his crucifixion, Jesus told his disciples, Do you not know that I can call down 12 legions of angels? But he didn't. Because nobody took his life from him. He laid it down of his own accord. That's what a shepherd does. He lays down his life for the sheep, for his people. And if you're a sheep, as Jesus said, if you're a sheep, you hear Jesus' voice. Jesus said, a stranger they would not follow. When you know Jesus, I really believe this. When you know Jesus, you know his voice. When somebody is speaking, if you know Jesus and they're speaking of the things of God or their love for the Lord or something from the scripture, when somebody is speaking and you know Jesus, you can hear Jesus' voice 
in what someone else is saying. I believe if you know Jesus, when you listen to somebody preach, you you can know whether that person is speaking for Jesus or not. Because the sheep hear his voice. And they will, they will not listen to strangers. When you hear, when you know Jesus, you hear him and you listen to him and you follow him. He is the good shepherd. What does a shepherd do? Right? What does a shepherd do? Well, he leads the way. He guides. He corrals. He knocks stubborn sheep upside the head. He binds wounds. He sets broken bones. He looks for the lost. He keeps them on the path. He leads them by still waters to green pastures. He defends them from enemies. He gets them to their intended destination. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the leader of the church. We are those sheep who hear his voice and refuse to listen to strangers. We are those who must beware of the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We'll hear the shepherd's voice and we'll listen to it. And not reluctantly, but gladly. When you're a lost sheep and the shepherd comes and finds you, you're glad to hear his voice. You're not sad about it. We are those who are led by his spirit, who who pray and talk and exercise sanctified reason to think through difficult issues by the grace of God because he leads us. He shows us the way and we listen and we must listen because Jesus is the good shepherd. So this, so the, the, the point is that Jesus leads the church. When we gather together and talk, when we gather together in meetings, when we gather together in church conference, what are we, do, what are we there to do? What, what are we trying to figure out when we do those things? Are we trying to figure out what we want for the church? Or are we trying to figure out what Jesus wants for the church? Who leads the church? That's the question, right? Whose will are we seeking? Whose leadership are we looking to? If, if we ask the wrong questions, we'll get the wrong answers. When we think about, okay, what's the right thing to do in any given situation? The question we should be asking is not, what do I think? The question we should be asking is, what does Jesus think? And then we do everything we can to try to discern by the power of the Spirit what Jesus thinks about a matter. The, 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 the reason why I believe in, um, in congregational polity and that I'm Baptist is because I believe that all believers are, all members are believers and all believers possess the Spirit And together, by the Spirit, we should be able to discern the will of Christ. Because His will must reign supreme in the church. Colossians 1.15 and following says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities... All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Who leads Cottondale Baptist Church? Jesus Christ. That's who leads our church. And so together, what is our job? It is to read and pray and study and and listen to discern the shepherd's voice. So that we know the right way to go. Jesus, look, sheep, sheep, half the time, how, how often you think the sheep has any idea what the shepherd's doing? 
Sometimes you just got to follow because you know that he's good. He is the good shepherd. So we follow him. So number one, Jesus leads the church. And number two, elders follow Jesus's lead. Jesus leads the church. And number two, elders follow Jesus's lead. This is uh, in Ephesians chapter four, verse 11 and following. Should be up on the screen there. It says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth uh, in love, we are to grow in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together with every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So Jesus leads the church, and next I want us to see that elders follow Jesus' lead. Okay, so what am I talking about? Well, everybody acknowledges that God gives leaders to the church. Okay, in fact, that's what the verse said right there in Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he gave, well, who's the he? God. God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So that last one there, God gave the, then it says the shepherds and teachers. So the, that construction in the Greek indicates that those, it's, it, that's one off, a shepherd teacher. They go together. Okay? Now, what's a shepherd? Well, in case y'all didn't know, the word pastor means shepherd. That's what the word means. The word pastor means shepherd. So when it's, so one way you could translate Ephesians 4.11 is God gave the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry because the word pastor means shepherd. So historically speaking, uh, Baptists have used the word pastor for this, the off, this office of shepherd and teacher. Okay. Uh, and when it says that God gave the shepherds and teachers, what do, what do Baptists say when, when, when they're getting a new pastor, they say something like this. Well, we, we're, we're calling. We're, we're calling. And a pastor will say something like, I feel called to the ministry or I feel called to this church. Well, what's the, what's the language of the calling about? Who's calling the pastor? Who? It has to be God, right? It has to be God. So, so the, so the, the church then, when a church calls a pastor, I think, you know, in the best case scenario, right, what's the church trying to do? They're not trying to say, we're hiring an employee. What are they saying? They're saying, we believe God has called this person to lead us. Because who gives, who gives them? God does. God gives the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Okay, so and and so it's and so what is it? It's a discerning of the spirit, and I believe I believe that's what happened when here. You know, I believe that the the those on the committee they prayed and sought God and believed God was calling me to be here, and I felt the same way. That is, it wasn't just a mere human decision, but it was divine working. Okay, and so. That's what the call of the pastors, that's what the language of the call of the pastors. It doesn't mean that the leader is infallible, of course, but it does mean that leadership within the church comes from God, comes from God and should receive and should be received as such. Right. And so uh, in this list given here, shepherds and teachers comes uh, last. OK, and, 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 and Baptists like the term pastor. Now, if you look in the. In the New Testament, okay, and this is part of the conversations that we've had. I'm just trying to expose you to some of these ideas, okay? If you look in the New Testament, there's three terms used for this office. Shepherd or pastor, elder, and overseer. 
Shepherd and pa- shepherd or pastor, elder, and overseer. There's three terms used for this office, okay? Baptists like the word pastor, and that's fine. But actually, the most common term used is elder in the New Testament. Is the most common term, is elder, okay? Now, how do we know that they're all the same office? Well, the clearest, the clearest uh, evidence is in Acts 20, which I read at the beginning of the service. And in verse 17 there, it says that... Um, that Paul sent from uh, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. So remember, Paul labored in Ephesus for a long time, several years, preaching and teaching the word of God. Now, he knows that he was about to go to Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit has already testified to him uh, that that probably wasn't going to turn out so well. If you've read the book of Acts, you know how that turns out. But he wants to see these the elders in particular. Okay, of the church, the elders of the church is what is what they're called. That's what they're referred to. Okay, to the church to come to him. So they're called elders. But then in Acts twenty twenty eight, it says he, he's he's talking to the elders, and what, what does he say? He says, pay, "Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God." which he obtained with his own blood. I know after my departure that fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. But I want you to look carefully there at Acts 20, 28. In Acts 20, 17, they were called elders. And then in Acts 20, 28, what does he say? He says, he says, pay attention to yourselves and the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So again, you know, pastors don't like to preach this sermon because it sounds like I'm tooting my own horn. But look, guys, I'm just preaching the Bible. It says that the Holy Spirit made them overseers. The Holy Spirit made them overseers. So in any church that, in any church, not, not any church, the best case scenario, what is, what is happening is that the church is discerning the will of the Holy Spirit of God. And that when they believe that God has called a man to lead them to the church, they are saying that the Holy Spirit has made this man an overseer of our church. And notice there that says the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God. Now, so, so, so notice they're called elders. Then the Holy Spirit has made them overseers. So that's the second term used, right? And an overseer means what? Someone who oversees things. They lead. Okay. And then the, and then the third thing it says to care for the church of God. To care for the church of God. Now, um, I think the KJV says to feed the church. But the word there literally means to shepherd. It's the same root as the word translated shepherd in other places. It's the same root. It's just a verb. To shepherd the church of God. That would be a literal translation. So so they're called elders. The Holy Spirit made them overseers, and their job is to shepherd. What is that? It's the office of pastor, elder, overseer. That's the job as it as described in the Bible. Okay? And so, and so. It's this, it's, so most interpreters have understood that this is the same office, pastor, elder, overseer, and the most common term used is elder. So that's just hopefully brings some clarity to some of the things that we're talking about here. Okay? And then, and then so the, the next question to think about it, when we're talking about elders is what's the qualifications for elders? Now, if you look in the scriptures, there's two main passages that deal with the qualifications, right? It's 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I'm actually about to preach through the book of Titus, or I'm going to going to talk about uh, talk about that. But if you look at those passages, First Timothy three and Titus one, what you see there is that the qualifications for elders are all character. Are all character. What does that mean? It means that the primary qualification for leading the church is to be people of character. You know. In the business world and so on, you know, we like, we like charismatic personalities. We like guys who could preach your socks off, you know, and, and all that stuff. But the Bible says, look, if you don't have character, it don't matter what else you got. It just doesn't matter. And so character is what matters. That's the qualification. It's, and if you, and if you go look, everything it asks of an elder or pastor overseer or whatever, it asks of all Christians in other places. So everyone is to, is to try to live up 
to the calling, the, the character qualifications, the, 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 the main point, the main difference is that if someone is going to function as an elder, pastor, overseer, they should be exemplary in those things because they're to be examples to the rest of the flock in what it looks like to follow Jesus. And so, and so when I refer, and so when I refer to elders, I just want it to be clear. It doesn't matter what you call them. It's the same office that we typically think of as pastor, and the other biblical term is overseer. Uh, the the uh, one translation of the word overseer, um, an old translation, is bishop, but we don't use that term because it's too confusing to people. And I'm not going to call myself Bishop Henley, um, and I don't want you to either. But it would be biblical, actually. Okay, um, so when we've been thinking through this and looking at this, one thing that I think that seems different and that is being proposed here um, is what we call a plurality of elders. So if you look in the New Testament, and again, you know, I just I encourage you, look in the scriptures. Everywhere a specific church is mentioned and then elders are referred to, it's always in the plural. It's always in the plural. Well, why is that? I'll tell you why. Because one man can't shepherd a church. It's impossible. Everywhere it's mentioned, the elders are mentioned of a local church. It's always in the plural. That means there's always more than one. There's a plurality of elders. Okay? That means that churches had more than one elder, more than one pastor, if you want to put it that way. More than one person carries the pastoral load of the church. And so I think, I think, that, I, I think this is so crucial. If I was going to, if I was going to, you know, I, I may be the proudest Baptist in, that, in this room. If there is a shortfall of Baptist, what has, what has over the long haul, I feel like has been a detriment to the Baptist church over the decades, it has been this. The, that most that many churches function with one pastor and elder, and then that person usually only stays three to four years, and that's it. I think for if you look at the strongest churches that are out there, it almost always is accompanied by long tenured pastors. Mm-hmm. Who are, who are ministering the word of God with other people around them helping them. And so it's something that as Baptists we need to think about in the long term. How can we, what can we do to set up, and that's what I'm thinking about, right? Because like I know, I know a lot of things, <laughs> I know that this change is a lot all at once. You know, and I'm happy to have conversations, but I just want you to know my heart that when I'm proposing some of these things, I'm thinking about Cottondale Baptist Church 50 years from now. I'm not just thinking about what would make me happy. I'm thinking about what would help set this church up for success. What structures could we put in place now so that it could be the healthiest church it could be 50 years from now? And the way that I think that would be is I think a plurality of elders is better because one, it's biblical. Two, it shares the pastoral load. So that it's not one man doing it all by himself. And it's just better for the church in the long term. Now think about this. If you have a plurality of, if you have multiple elder, pastor, overseer, qualified men, and they're serving and they're working together, what happens in lots of Baptist churches? Well, the pastor comes in, he's got a vision, he's got a way he wants to do things, he's got a way he wants to lead, the church has a vision and so on. And he does that, but then what, what happens? That pastor leaves, and then what happens? Well, then lots of times, if we're honest, the whole church hits a pause button until the next guy comes in. And then the next guy does whatever he was going to do, regardless of what was going on before him, right? But if you have a plurality of elder qualified men, 
You have a team of people so that in the absence of a lead pastor, you have other pastors there who are already called and equipped and who know the church, who are qualified to lead the church in that, in that intervening period so that there's no, there's no vacuum of leadership. And then at the same time, when they, they can help ensure then that when the church calls another lead pastor, if you will, then that per, they can help ensure that person is in tune with the already established mission and vision of the church, that it's just going to carry forward in lockstep with what the church has already been doing. Okay, so I I think these are some important ideas and important benefits of this. I think it's important, too, to, to, to understand when I'm talking about elders, pastors, I'm not just talking about somebody who gets paid by the church and who and who does pastoral ministry vocationally. I believe in what's called I believe that many, I believe that God calls different men to, to function as shepherds within the church, and that may or may not be vocationally. So what I'm suggesting is that there can be men within the church who are lay, lay elders, if you will. They're not necessarily, they don't, they don't feel, they don't think, it's my, I want to, I want to make a living from that, but I'm still gifted pastorally. God has called me to serve this church in this way. Okay, and 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 um, and so I think that in an ideal case scenario, you have an elder board who is made up of both paid staff members and lay elders within the church. I think that's crucial for the long term health of, of, of the church. And I think it's crucial that as a church, we get serious about about. Especially, let me just say, especially the men in our church, that we get serious about being the kind of men that whether God ever calls us to, 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 to eldership or not, to be the kind of men who could lead the church if God called on us to do that. That's what the church needs. So I think there's just lots of advantages to this. This is why I'm recommending it. So the the pastor, so like again, in an elder board situation, it's not the it's not you know lead pastor, whatever you want to call him, senior pastor. He's not he's not the man in charge. He's got one vote with everybody else. That's it. There's accountability there. If something happens, you have a whole team of people who can help you. It uses the gifts and calling of people in the church who um, are gifted and called, but maybe not called to full-time ministry. Okay. So these are just some thoughts when we look at, at elders. The only, if, you, if you look at it, the only skill that an elder has to have, skill, is the ability to teach. Because as an elder, as a pastor, as an overseer, you do have to teach. You have to be able to teach the Word of God. You have to, you have to know your Bible. You have, to, you have to be a master of the Bible, and the Bible has to have mastered you. Because the elders are the, the guardians of the doctrine of the church. So that is, that's, it's, an important, it's, it's, it's an important skill. Because one of the most common warnings that Paul gives for the church is false teachers. And if you remember in Acts chapter 20, Paul told the Ephesian elders that fierce wolves would come from among you. Among you. To devour the flock. So it takes character, courage, wisdom, uh, knowledge of the scripture, the ability to teach. It's a high calling, which is why James says, let not many of you be teachers, for teachers will be held to a stricter judgment. One of my favorite passages um, I've been memorizing is 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4. Peter says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. 
Not everybody is called to be an elder pastor overseer of a church, but some are. Peter says, do it not under compulsion, but willingly, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering, but being examples. Because when the chief, chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. There is a special gift of grace, I think, for those called to this task. And I pray that God would raise up such men in our church. Elders, pastors, overseers, they may be shepherds, but Jesus is the chief shepherd. One thing that we can never forget is Elders, shepherd, pastors, pastors. But pastors are still sheep too. Jesus is my pastor. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me down paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He does that for us all because he's the good shepherd. And so as we go forward as a church, you know, I just, uh, um, I want to be clear. I want to explain things. I want to be wise. The biggest thing, the most important thing we do as a church is not the exact words in our constitution. It's not the exact structure that we organize ourselves by. The most important thing we do is follow Jesus. If we do that, everything else will be okay. But we got to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the good shepherd. You're so good, God. You're so good. Thank you for loving me as wayward as a, as a sheep if I, as I have been at times. Thank you for always coming after me to bring me back. Lord, I pray that you would show yourself to be a strong shepherd to everybody in this room this morning. I know many people are going through a lot of heartache and sorrow and pain. But you are a shepherd who binds the brokenhearted, who sets those broken bones, who who puts salve on our wounds, God, who will pick us up and carry us on your shoulders when we can't carry ourselves. And I pray that you would be a comfort to those suffering today. And Lord Jesus, we look to you as the shepherd of our church. Lord, we don't, we don't, we're just sheep, Lord. We don't know what's going on half the time. I pray, God, that you would just help us to discern your voice and to follow you. That's all we want to do, Lord Jesus, is to follow you. Lead us down paths of righteousness for your namesake. And it's in Christ's name we pray.